Section twenty nine of Arts and Crafts Essays. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Peter Yearsley. Woods and Other Materials by Stephen Webb. The woods in ordinary use by cabinet makers may be divided broadly into two classes namely those which by their strength toughness and other qualities are suitable for construction and those which by reason of the beauty of their texture or grain their rarity or their costliness have come to be used chiefly for decorative purposes veneering or inlaying there are certainly several woods which combine the qualities necessary for either purpose as will be noticed later on at present the above classification is sufficiently accurate for the purposes of this paper the woods chiefly used in the construction of cabinet work and furniture are oak walnut mahogany rosewood satinwood cedar plain sycamore the oak has been made the standard by which to measure all other woods for the qualities of strength toughness and durability there are said to be nearly fifty species of oak known but the common english oak possesses these qualities in a far greater degree than any other wood it is however very cross-grained and difficult to manage where delicate details are required and its qualities recommend it to the carpenter rather than to the furniture maker who prefers the softer and straight-grained oak from turkey or wainscot from holland which in addition to being more easily worked and taking a higher finish is not so liable to warp or split there is also a species called white oak which is imported into this country from america and is largely used for interior fittings and cabinet making it is not equal to the british oak in strength or durability and it is inferior to the wainscot in the beauty of its markings the better the quality of this oak the more it shrinks in drying walnut is a favorite wood with the furniture maker as well as the carver on account of its even texture and straight grain the english variety is of a light grayish brown color which color improves much by age under polish that from italy has more gray in it and though it looks extremely well when carved is less liked by carvers on account of its brittleness it is but little liable to the attacks of worms in the english kind the older and therefore generally speaking the better wood may be recognized by its darker color of mahogany there are two kinds namely those which are grown in the islands of cuba and jamaica and in honduras the cuba or spanish mahogany is much the harder and more durable and is in the opinion of the writer the very best wood for all the purposes of the cabinet or furniture maker known to us it is beautifully figured takes a fine polish is not difficult to work when its extreme hardness is taken into account and is less subject to twisting and warping than any other kind of wood it has become so costly of late years however that it is mostly cut into veneers and used for the decoration of furniture surfaces honduras mahogany or as cabinet makers call it bay wood is that which is now in most frequent demand for the construction of the best kinds of furniture and cabinet work it is fairly strong though it cannot compare in that respect with cuba or rosewood works easily does not shrink resists changes of temperature without alteration and holds glue well all of which qualities specially recommend it for the purposes of construction where veneers are to be used many cabinet makers prefer to use this wood for drawers even in an oak job rosewood is one of those woods used indifferently for construction or for the decoration of other woods though beautiful specimens of grain and figure are often seen its color does not compare with good specimens of cuba veneer its purple tone whatever stains are used is not so agreeable as the rich deep mellow browns of the mahogany nor does it harmonize so readily with its surroundings in an ordinary room it has great strength and durability and is not difficult to work probably the best way to use it constructively 
is in the making of small cabinets chairs etc that is if one wishes for an appearance of lightness with real strength the writer does not here offer any opinion as to whether a piece of furniture or indeed anything else should or should not look strong when it really is so satin wood most of which comes from the west india islands is well known for its fine lustre and grain as also for its warm colour which is usually deepened by yellow stain it is much used for painted furniture and the plain variety is liked by the carver cedar is too well known to need any description here it is commonly believed that no worm will touch it and it is therefore greatly in demand for the interior fitting of cabinets drawers etc it is a straight-grained wood and fairly easy to work though liable to split it is impossible in a short paper like the present to do more than glance at a few of the numerous other woods in common use ebony has always been greatly liked for small or elaborate caskets or cabinets its extreme closeness of grain and hardness enabling the carver to bring up the smallest details with all the sharpness of metalwork sycamore beech and holly are frequently stained to imitate walnut rosewood or other materials of these the first two are used constructively but the latter which takes the stain best is nearly all cut into veneer and in addition to its use for covering large surfaces forms an important element in the modern marquetry decorations basswood on account of its softness and the facility with which it can be stained to any requisite shade is extensively used to imitate other woods in modern furniture of the cheaper sort it should however never be used for furniture at all as it has as a cabinet maker would say no nature in it and in the result there is no wear in it other woods coming under the second category as amboyna coromandel snakewood orangewood thuya are all woods of a beautiful figure which may be varied indefinitely by cutting the veneers at different angles to the grain of the wood and the tone may also be varied by the introduction of colour into the polish which is used on them coromandel wood is one of the most beautiful of these but it is not so available as it would otherwise be on account of its resistance to glue orange wood when not stained is very wasteful in use as the natural colour is confined to the heart of the tree silver white metal brass etc are cut into a veneer of tortoise shell or mother of pearl producing a decorative effect which in the opinion of the writer is more accurately described as gorgeous than beautiful there are many processes and materials used to alter or modify the colour of woods and to convert one wood into another oak is made dark by being subjected to the fumes of liquid ammonia which penetrate it to almost any depth ordinary oak is made into brown oak by being treated with a solution of chromate of potash which is also used to convert various light woods into mahogany etc pearl ash is used for the same purpose though not commonly for converting pear tree sycamore etc into ebony two or more applications of logwood chips with an after application of vinegar and steel filings are used a good deal of bedroom and other furniture is enamelled and here the ground is prepared with size and whiting and this is worked over with flake white transparent polish and bismuth but by far the most beautiful surface treatment in this kind are the lacquers composed of spirit and various gums or of shellac and spirit into which colour is introduced stephen webb End of section 29。section 30 of arts and crafts essays。this is a librivox recording。all librivox recordings are in the public domain。for more information or to volunteer。please visit librivox.org。of embroidery by may morris。
the technicalities of embroidery are very simple and its tools few practically consisting of a needle and nothing else the work can be wrought loose in the hand or stretched in a frame which latter mode is often advisable always when smooth and minute work is aimed at there are no mysteries of method beyond a few elementary rules that can be quickly learnt no way to perfection except that of care and patience and love of the work itself this being so the more is demanded from design and execution we look for complete triumph over the limitations of process and material and what is equally important a certain judgment and self-restraint and in short those mental qualities that distinguish mechanical from intelligent work the latitude allowed to the worker the lavishness and ingenuity displayed in the stitches employed in short the vivid expression of the worker's individuality form a great part of the success of needlework the varieties of stitch are too many to be closely described without diagrams but the chief are as follows chain stitch consists of loops simulating the links of a simple chain some of the most famous work of the middle ages was worked in this stitch which is enduring and of its nature necessitates careful execution we are more familiar with it in the dainty work of the seventeenth and eighteenth centuries in the airy brightness and simplicity of which lies a peculiar charm contrasted with the more pompous and pretentious work of the same period this stitch is also wrought with a hook on any loose material stretched in a tambour frame tapestry stitch consists of a building up of stitches laid one beside another and gives a surface slightly resembling that of tapestry i give the name as it is so often used but it is vague and leads to the confusion that exists in people's minds between loom tapestry and embroidery the stitch is worked in a frame and is particularly suitable for the drapery of figures and anything that requires skillful blending of several colors or a certain amount of shading this facility of painting with the needle is in itself a danger for it tempts some people to produce a highly shaded imitation of a picture an attempt which must be a failure both as a decorative and as a pictorial achievement it cannot be said too often that the essential qualities of all good needlework are a broad surface bold lines and pure brilliant and as a rule simple coloring all of which being qualities attainable through and prescribed by the limitations of this art applique has been and is still a favorite method of work which vasari tells us botticelli praised as being very suitable to processional banners and hangings used in the open air as it is solid and enduring also bold and effective in style it is more accurately described as a method of work in which various stitches are made use of for it consists of designs embroidered on a stout ground and then cut out and laid on silk or velvet and edged round with lines of gold or silk and sometimes with pearls it requires considerable deftness and judgment in applying as the work could well be spoilt by clumsy and heavy finishing it is now looked upon as solely ecclesiastical i believe and is associated in our minds with garish red gold and white and with dull geometric ornament though there is absolutely no reason why church embroidery of today should be limited to ungraceful forms and staring colors a certain period of work thick and solid but not very interesting either as to method or design has been stereotyped into what is known as ecclesiastical embroidery the mechanical characteristics of the style being of course emphasized and exaggerated in the process church work will never be of the finest while these characteristics are insisted on the more pity as it is seemly that the richest and noblest work should be devoted to churches and to all buildings that belong to and are an expression of the communal life of the people another and simpler form of applied work is to cut out the desired forms in one material and lay upon another 
securing the applique with stitches round the outline, which are hidden by an edging cord. The work may be further enriched by light ornament of lines and flourishes laid directly on the ground material. Couching is an effective method of work, in which broad masses of silk or gold thread are laid down and secured by a network or diaper of crossing threads, through which the under surface shines very prettily. It is often used in conjunction with applique. There are as many varieties of couching stitches as the worker has invention for. In sum, the threads are laid simply and flatly on the form to be covered, while in others a slight relief is obtained by layers of soft linen thread which form a kind of molding or stuffing, and which are covered by the silk threads or whatever is to be the final decorative surface. The ingenious patchwork coverlets of our grandmothers, formed of scraps of old gowns pieced together in certain symmetrical forms, constitute the romance of family history, but this method has an older origin than would be imagined. Queen Isis M. Keb's embalmed body went down the Nile to its burial place under a canopy that was lately discovered and is preserved in the Bulak Museum. It consists of many squares of gazelle hide of different colors sewn together and ornamented with various devices. Under the name of patchwork, or mosaic-like piecing together of different colored stuffs, comes also the Persian work made at Resht. Bits of fine cloth are cut out for leaves, flowers, and so forth, and neatly stitched together with great accuracy. This done, the work is further carried out and enriched by chain and other stitches. The result is perfectly smooth, flat work, no easy feat, when done on a large scale, as it often is. Darning and running need little explanation. The former stitch is familiar to us in the well-known Cretan and Turkish cloths. The stitch here is used mechanically in parallel lines and simulates weaving, so that these handsome borders in a deep, rich red might as well have come from the loom as from the needle. Another method of darning is looser and coarser, and suitable only for cloths and hangings not subject to much wear and rubbing. The stitches follow the curves of the design, which the needle paints, as it were, shading and blending the colors. It is necessary to use this facility for shading temperately, however, or the flatness essential to decorative work is lost. The foregoing is a rough list of stitches which could be copiously supplemented, but that I am obliged to pass on to another important point, that of design. If needlework is to be looked upon seriously, it is necessary to secure appropriate and practicable designs. Where the worker does not invent for herself, she should at least interpret her designer, just as the designer interprets and does not attempt to imitate nature. It follows from this that it is better to avoid using designs of artists who know nothing of the capacities of needlework, and design beautiful and intricate forms without reference to the execution, the result being unsatisfactory and incomplete. Regarding the design itself, broad bold lines should be chosen, and broad harmonious color, which should be roughly planned before setting to work, with as much minute work and stitches introducing play of color as befits the purpose of the work and humor of the worker. There should be no scratching, no indefiniteness of form or color, no vagueness that allows the eye to puzzle over the design beyond that indefinable sense of mystery which arrests the attention and withholds the full charm of the work for a moment to unfold it to those who stop to give it more than a glance but there are so many different stitches and so many different modes of setting to work that it will soon be seen that these few hints do not apply to all of them. One method, for instance, consists of trusting entirely to design and leaves color out of account. White work on white linen, white on dark ground, or black or dark blue upon white. Again, some work depends more on magnificence of color than on form, as, for example, the handsome Italian hangings of the 17th century, 
worked in floss silk, on linen sometimes, and sometimes on a dusky open canvas which makes the silks gleam and glow like precious stones. In thus slightly describing the methods chiefly used in embroidery, I do so principally from old examples, as modern embroidery, being a dilettante pastime, has little distinct character, and is, in its best points, usually imitative. Eastern work still retains the old professional skill, but beauty of color is rapidly disappearing, and little attention is paid to durability of the dyes used. In speaking rather slightingly of modern needlework, I must add that its non-success is often due more to the use of poor materials than to want of skill in working. It is surely folly to waste time over work that looks shabby in a month. The worker should use judgment and thought to procure materials, not necessarily rich, but each good and genuine of its kind. Lastly, she should not be sparing of her own handiwork, for while a slightly executed piece of work depends wholly on design, in one where the actual stitchery is more elaborate, but the design less masterly, the patience and thought lavished on it render it in a different way equally pleasing, and bring it more within the scope of the amateur. End of section 30. Recording by Linda Johnson. Section 31 of Arts and Crafts Essays. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. Of Materials. By May Morris. Almost every fabric that is good of its kind is suitable for a ground for needlework, and any thread of silk, linen, cotton, or wool is suitable for laying on a web, with the purpose of decorating it. Yet these materials should not be wetted indiscriminately, every surface requiring its peculiar treatment, a loose woolen fabric, for example, being best covered with wool work, rather than with silk. Not that it is necessary to work in linen thread on linen ground, in silk on silk ground, and so forth. Silk upon linen, silk on canvas, wool on linen, are legitimate because suitable combinations it being scarcely necessary to note that linen or wool threads should not be used on silk surface as to place the poorer on the richer material would be an error in taste gold thread and precious stones will of course be reserved for the richer grounds and the more elaborate kinds of work a plain or a figured damask silk can be employed as a ground for needlework the broken surface of a good damask sometimes enriching and helping out the design if work is to be laid directly on silk ground it should be rather open and light in character if closer stitches are wanted the principal forms are usually done on a canvas or linen backing which is then cut out and applied to the final silk ground the design being carried on and completed by lighter work of lines and curves and by the enrichment of gold thread and sometimes even precious stones these two methods are a serious and dignified form of embroidery and were often used by the great medieval embroiderers on a rich figured or damask silk and sometimes on plain silk and sometimes on a silky velvet it is not easy to procure absolutely pure undressed silk now and pliable silk velvet of a suitable nature is still more difficult to obtain satin is to my thinking almost too shiny a surface for a ground but it may occasionally be useful for small work a sort of imitation called roman satin is sometimes employed on account of its cheapness and effectiveness i suppose as it cannot be for its beauty the texture when much handled being woolly and unpleasant no one taking trouble to procure choice materials will think of making use of it floss silk lends itself particularly to the kind of needlework we are speaking of there is no twist on it the silk is pure and untouched if properly dyed has a soft gloss and a yielding surface that renders it quite the foremost of embroidery silks though its delicate texture requires skilful handling 
but avoid silks that profess to be floss with the difficulty in handling removed if the old workers could use a pure untwisted floss surely we can take the trouble to conquer this difficulty and do the same twisted silk if used on a silk ground should i think be rather fine if thick and much twisted it stands out in relief against the ground and gives a hard and ropey appearance i am in fact assuming that work on so costly a material as pure thick silk is to be rather fine than coarse gold and silver thread is much used with silk but it is almost impossible to keep the silver from tarnishing ordinary gold passing which consists of a gilt silver thread wound round silk is also apt to tarnish and should always be lacquered before using a rather troublesome process to do at home as the gold has to be unwound and brushed over with the lacquer and should be dried in a warm room free from damp or on a hot sunny day japanese paper gold is useful for the reason that it does not tarnish though in some ways it is more troublesome to manage than the gold that can be threaded in a needle and passed through the material it consists like much of the ancient gold thread of a gilded strip of paper wound round silk the old gold being gilded vellum when not the flat gold beaten out thin as by the by in many of the eastern towels made to-day where the flat tinsel is very cleverly used for needlework for more ordinary uses linen is by far the most pleasing and enduring web unlike silk on the one side and wool on the other it has scarcely any limitations in treatment or in material suitable to be used on it for hangings it can be chosen of a loose large texture and covered with bold work executed in silk linen thread or wool or it can be chosen of the finest thread and covered with minute delicate stitches it can be worked equally well in the hand or in a frame and usually the more it is handled the better it looks a thick twisted silk is excellent for big and coarse work on linen the stitches used being on the same scale big and bold and finer silk used sparingly if needed white linen thread is often the material employed for linen altar cloths coverlets etc and some extremely choice examples of such work are to be seen in our museums some worked roughly with a large linen thread and big stitches some with patient minuteness it is hardly necessary to say how important the design of such work is different qualities of this material will be suggested to the embroideress by her needs but before passing to other things i should not omit mention of the charming linen woven at langdale for some purposes it is very useful as good linen for embroidering on is not easy to obtain we have however yet to find a web which will resemble the rougher and coarser linens used for old embroideries rather loosely woven with a thick glossy thread and of a heavy yet yielding substance quite unlike the hard paper-like surfaces of machine-made linens the langdale linen is of course hand-spun and hand-made and the flat silky thread gives a very pleasant surface but owing to its price and fine texture it is not always suitable for the purposes of large hangings many fine examples of persian work such as quilts and so forth are executed on a white cotton ground neither very fine nor very coarse entirely in floss silk a variety of stitches being used and the brightest possible colors chosen the cool silky surface of linen however commends itself more to us than cotton each country rightly choosing the materials nearest to hand in this as in other decorative arts both linen and cotton are good grounds for wool work of which the most satisfactory kind is that done on a large scale with a variety of close and curious stitches within bold curves and outlines canvas and net are open textures of linen or cotton and can be used either as a groundwork covered entirely with some stitch like the old-fashioned cross stitch or tent stitch or some kindred mechanical stitch or it can stand as the ground to be decorated with bright silks the texture of canvas being coarse the design for it should be chosen on a large scale and thick silk used floss preferably as the glossiest but a thick twisted silk is almost equally effective and rather easier to handle 
this canvas is used frequently in seventeenth-century italian room hangings either in the natural brownish color or dyed blue or green the dye on it giving a dusky neutral color which well shows up the richness of the silk of woolen materials cloth is the king though as a ground for needle decoration it has its limitations it forms a good basis for applique the groups of ornament being worked separately and laid on the cloth with threads and cords of silk gold or wool according to the treatment decided on rough serge gives a good surface for large open wool work such work is quickly done and could be made a very pleasing decoration for walls see the delightful inventories of the worldly goods of sir john fastolf in the notes to the pastel letters where the description of green and blue worsted hangings and bankers worked over with roses and boughs and hunting scenes make one long to emulate the rich fancies of forgotten arts and try to plan out similar work much of which was quite unambitious and simple both in design and execution slack a slightly twisted wool worsted and cruel are usually the forms of work used of these slack wool is the pleasantest for large work worsted being too harsh cruel is very fine and much twisted often met with in old work of a fine kind the advantage of wool over silk in cost is obvious and renders it suitable for the commoner uses of life where lavishness would be out of place may morris end of section thirty one Section 33 of Arts and Crafts Essays. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Stitches and Mechanism by Alan S. Cole. As a guiding classification of methods of embroidery considered from the technical point of view, I have set down the following heads. A embroidery of materials in frames b embroidery of materials held in the hand c positions of the needle in making stitches d varieties of stitches e effects of stitches in relation to materials into which they are worked f methods of stitching different materials together g embroidery in relief h embroidery on open grounds like net etc i drawn threadwork needlepoint lace j embroidery allied to tapestry weaving in the first place i define embroidery as the ornamental enrichment by needlework of a given material such material is usually a closely woven stuff but skins of animals leather etc also serve as foundations for embroidery and so do nets a materials to be embroidered may be either stretched out in a frame or held loosely b in the hand experience decides when either way is the better for embroidery upon nets frames are indispensable the use of frames is also necessary when a particular aim of the embroiderer is to secure an even tension of stitch throughout his work there are various frames some large and standing on trestles in these many feet of material can be stretched out then there are small handy frames in which a square foot or two of material is stretched and again there are smaller frames usually circular in which a few inches of materials of delicate texture like muslin and cambric may be stretched oriental embroiderers like those of china japan persia and india are great users of frames for their work c stitches having peculiar or individual characteristics are comparatively few almost all are in use for plain needlework it is through the employment of them to render or express ornament or pattern that they become embroidery stitches some embroiderers and some schools of embroidery contend that the number of embroidery stitches is almost infinite 
this however is probably one of the myths of the craft to begin with there are barely more than two different positions in which the needle is held for making a stitch one when the needle is passed more or less horizontally through the material the other when the needle is worked more or less vertically in respect of the first named way the point of the needle enters the material usually in two places and one pull takes the embroidery thread into the material more or less horizontally or along or behind its surface in the second the needle is passed upwards from beneath the material pulled right through it and then returned downwards so that there are two pulls instead of one to complete a single stitch a hooked or crochet needle with a handle is held more or less vertically for working a chain stitch upon the surface of a material stretched in a frame but this is a method of embroidery involving the use of an implement distinct from that done with the ordinary and freely plied needle still including this last named method which comes into the class of embroidery done with the needle in a more or less vertical position we do not get more than two distinctive positions for holding the embroidery needle d varieties of stitches may be classified under two sections one of stitches in which the thread is looped as in chain stitch knotted stitches and buttonhole stitch the other of stitches in which the thread is not looped but lies flatly as in short and long stitches cruel or feather stitches as they are sometimes called darning stitches tent and cross stitches and satin stitch almost all of these stitches produce different sorts of surface or texture in the embroidery done with them chain stitches for instance give a broken or granular looking surface this effect in surface is more strongly marked when knotted stitches are used satin stitches give a flat surface and are generally used for embroidery or details which are to be of an even tint of color cruel or long and short stitches combined give a slightly less even texture than satin stitches cruel stitch is specially adapted to the rendering of colored surfaces of work in which different tints are to modulate into one another e the effects of stitches in relation to the materials into which they are worked can be considered under two broadly marked divisions the one is in regard to embroidery which is to produce an effect on one side only of a material the other to embroidery which shall produce similar effects equally on both the back and front of the material a darning and a satin stitch may be worked so that the embroidery has almost the same effect on both sides of the material chain stitch and cruel stitch can only be used with regard to effect on one side of the material f but these suggestions for a simple classification of embroidery do not by any means apply to many methods of so-called embroidery the effects of which depend upon something more than stitches in these other methods cutting materials into shapes stitching materials together or on to one another and drawing certain threads out of a woven material and then working over the undrawn threads are involved applied or applique work is generally used in connection with ornament of bold forms the larger and principal forms are cut out of one material and then stitched down to another the junctures of the edges of the cut-out forms being usually concealed and the shapes of the forms emphasized by cord stitched along them patchwork depends for successful effect upon skill in cutting out the several pieces which are to be stitched together patchwork is a sort of mosaic work in textile materials and far beyond the homely patchwork quilt of country cottages patchwork lends itself to the production of ingenious counterchanges of form and color in complex patterns these methods of applique and patchwork are peculiarly adapted to ornamental needlework which is to lie or hang stretched out flatly and are not suited therefore to work in which is involved a calculated beauty of effect from folds
g there are two or three classes of embroidery in relief which are not well adapted to embroideries on lysum materials in which folds are to be considered quilting is one of these classes it may be artistically employed for rendering low relief ornament by means of a stout cord or padding placed between two bits of stuff which are then ornamentally stitched together so that the cord or padding may fill out and give slight relief to the ornamental portions defined by and enclosed between the lines of stitching there is also padded embroidery or work consisting of a number of details separately wrought in relief over padding of hanks of thread wadding and such like effects of high relief are obtainable by this method another class but of lower relief embroidery is couching in which cords and gimps are laid side by side in groups upon the face of a material and then stitched down to it various effects can be obtained in this method the color of the thread used to stitch the cords or gimp down may be different from that of the cords or gimp and the stitches may of course be so taken as to produce small powdered or diaper patterns over the face of the groups of cords or gimp gold cords are often used in this class of work which is peculiarly identified with ecclesiastical embroideries of the fifteenth and sixteenth centuries as also with japanese work of later date h the embroidery and work hitherto alluded to has been such as requires a foundation of a closely woven nature like linen cloth silk and velvet but there are varieties of embroidery done upon netted or meshed grounds and on to these open grounds embroidery in darning and chain stitches can be wrought for the most part the embroideries upon open or meshed grounds have a lace-like appearance in lace the contrast between close work and open or partially open spaces about it plays an important part the methods of making lace by the needle or by bobbins on a cushion are totally distinct from the methods of making lace-like embroideries upon net i akin to lace and embroideries upon net is embroidery in which much of its special effect is obtained by the withdrawal of threads from the material and then either whipping or overcasting in buttonhole stitches the undrawn threads the persians and embroiderers in the grecian archipelago have excelled in such work producing wondrously delicate textile grills of ingenious geometric patterns in this drawn thread work as it is called we often meet with the employment of buttonhole stitching which is an important stitch in making needlepoint lace j we also meet with the use of a weaving stitch resembling in effect on a small scale willow weaving for hurdles this weaving stitch and the method of compacting together the threads made with it are closely allied to that special method of weaving known as tapestry weaving some of the earliest specimens of tapestry weaving consist of ornamental borders bands and panels which were inwoven into tunics and cloaks worn by greeks and romans from the fourth century before christ up to the eighth or ninth after christ the scale of the work in these is so small as compared with that of large tapestry wall hangings of the fifteenth century that the method may be regarded as being related more to drawn thread embroidery than to weaving into an extensive field of warp threads a sketch of the different employments of the foregoing methods of embroidery is not to be included in this paper the universality of embroidery from the earliest of historic times is attested by evidences of its practice amongst primitive tribes throughout the world fragments of stitched materials or undoubted indications of them have been found in the remains of early american indians and in the cave dwellings of men who lived thousands of years before the period of historic egyptians and assyrians of greek short and long stitch and chain stitch and applique embroidery 
there are specimens of the third or fourth century b c preserved in the hermitage at st petersburg babylonians egyptians greeks and romans were skilful in the use of tapestry weaving stitches dainty embroidery with delicate silken threads was practiced by the chinese long before similar work was done in the countries west of persia or in countries which came within the byzantine empire in the early days of that empire the emperor theodosius i framed rules respecting the importation of silk and made regulations for the labor employed in the gynecea the public weaving and embroidering rooms of that period the development and organization of which are traceable to the apartments allotted in private houses to the sempstresses and embroideresses who formed part of the well-to-do households of early classic times end of section thirty three recording by linda johnson section thirty four of arts and crafts essays this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b design by john d setting drink waters out of thine own cistern and running waters out of thine own well solomon produce produce be it but the infinitesimalest product produce carlyle for the last sixty years ever since the gothic revival set in we have done our best to resuscitate the art of embroidery first the church and then the world took up the task and much admirable work has been done by the schools the shops and at home and yet the verdict still must be the old is better considering all things this lack of absolute success is perplexing and needs to be explained for we have realized our ideals never was a time when the art and science of needlework were so thoroughly understood as in england at the present moment our designers can design in any style every old method is at our fingers ends every ingenious stitch of old humanity has been mastered and a descriptive name given to it of our own devising every traditional pattern wave lotus daisy convolvulus honeysuckle sacred horn or tree of life every animal form or bird fish or reptile has been traced to its source and its symbolism laid bare every phase of the world's primal schools of design egyptian babylonian indian chinese greek byzantine european has been illustrated and made easy of imitation we are archaeologists we are critics we are artists we are lovers of old work we are learned in historical and aesthetic questions in technical rules and principles of design we are colorists and can play with color as musicians play with notes what is more we are in terrible earnestness about the whole business the honor of the british nation the credit of royalty are in a manner staked upon the success of our schools of needlework and yet in spite of all these favoring circumstances we get no nearer to the old work that first mocked us to emulation in regard to power of initiative and human interest truth and gallantry prompt me to add it is not in stitchery but in design that we lag behind the old fair english hands can copy every trick of ancient artistry finger skill was never defter will was never more ardent to do fine things than now yet our work hangs fire it fails in design why now emerson has well said that all the arts have their origin in some enthusiasm mark this however that whereas the design of old needlework is based upon enthusiasm for birds flowers and animal life the design of modern needlework has its origin in enthusiasm for antique art nature is of course the groundwork of all art even of ours but it is not to nature at first hand that we go the flowers we embroider were not plucked from field and garden but from the camphor-scented preserves at kensington 
our needlework conveys no pretty message of the life that breathes the life that lives it savors only of the now stiff and stark device of dead hands our art holds no mirror up to nature as we see her it only reflects the reflection of dead periods nay not content with merely rifling the motifs of moth fretted rags we must needs turn for novelty to an old persian tile which well magnified makes a capital design for a quilt that one might perchance sleep under in spite of what is outside or we are not ashamed to ask our best embroideresses to copy the barbaric wriggles and childlike crudities of a seventh century book of kells a task which cramps her style and robs celtic art of all its wonder we have i said realized our ideals we can do splendidly what we set ourselves to do namely to mimic old masterpieces the question is what next shall we continue to hunt old trails and die not leaving the world richer than we found it or shall we for art and honor's sake boldly adventure something drop this wearisome translation of old styles and translate nature instead think of the gain to the schools and to the designers themselves if we elect to take another starting point no more museum inspired work no more scruples about styles no more dry as dust stock patterns no more loathly persian tile quilts no more awful zoomorphic tablecloths no more cast iron looking altar cloths or cyan cope angels or stumpy norfolk screen saints no more tudor roses and pumped out christian imagery suggesting that christianity is dead and buried but instead we shall have design by living men for living men something that expresses fresh realizations of sacred facts personal broodings skill joy in nature in grace of form and gladness of color design that shall recall shakespeare's maid who with her kneeled composes nature's own shape of bud bird branch or berry that even art sisters the natural roses for after all modern design should be as the old living thought artfully expressed fancy that has taken fair shapes and needlework is still a pictorial art that requires a real artist to direct the design a real artist to ply the needle given these and our needlework can be as full of story as the bayeux tapestry as full of imagery as the scion cope and better drawn the charm of old embroidery lies in this that it clothes current thought in current shapes it meant something to the workers and to the man in the street for whom it was done and for our work to gain the same sensibility the same range of appeal the same human interest we must employ the same means we must clothe modern ideas in modern dress adorn our design with living fancy and rise to the height of our knowledge and capacities doubtless there is danger to the untrained designer in direct resort to nature for the tendency in his or her case is to copy outright to give us pure crude fact and not to design at all still there is hope and honest error none in the icy perfections of the mere stylist for the unskilled designer there is no training like drawing from an old herbal for in all drawing of nature there is a large element of design besides which the very limitations of the materials used in realizing a design in needlework be it ever so naturally colored hinders a too definite presentation of the real for the professional stylist the confirmed conventionalist an hour in his garden a stroll in the embroidered meadows a dip into an old herbal a few carefully drawn cribs from curtis's botanical magazine or even for lack of something better sutton's last illustrated catalogue is wholesome exercise and will do more to revive the original instincts of a true designer than a month of sixpenny days at a stuffy museum the old masters are dead but the flowers as victor hugo says the flowers last always john d setting end of section thirty four
Section 35 of Arts and Crafts Essays. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. On Designing for the Art of Embroidery by Selwyn Image. In every form of art, the thing which is of primary importance is the question of design. By design, I understand the inventive arrangement of lines and masses for their own sake in such a relation to one another that they form a fine harmonious whole a whole that is towards which each part contributes and is in such a combination with every other part that the result is a unity of effect so completely satisfying us that we have no sense of demanding in it more or less after this statement and definition let me proceed to touch briefly upon four points in relation to the matter as it concerns itself with the art of embroidery and the first of these four points shall be this before you commence your design consider carefully the conditions under which the finished work is to be seen there is a tendency in embroidery to be too uniformly delicate and minute to be too delicate or even minute in something which is always to be seen close under one's eyes is it may be impossible but in an altar cloth a banner a wall hanging this delicacy and minuteness are not merely thrown away but they tend to make the thing ineffective for such objects as these i have mentioned the main lines and masses of the design should it would seem in the nature of the case be well emphasized if they are well emphasized and of course fine in their character and arrangement there is produced a sense of largeness and dignity which is of the highest value and for the absence of which no amount of curious workmanship will atone in making your design let these main lines and masses be the first things you attend to and secure stand away at a distance and see if they tell out satisfactorily before you go on to put in a single touch of detail for the second point remember that embroidery deals with its objects as if they were all on the same plane it has been sometimes described as the art of painting with the needle but it necessarily and essentially differs from the art of painting in this that it properly represents all things as being equally near to you as laid out before you on the same plane it would seem therefore to be a sound rule to fill the spaces left for you by the arrangement of your main lines and masses with such forms as shall occupy these spaces one by one completely with such patterns i mean as shall appear to have their natural and full development within the limits of each space avoid the appearance of one thing being behind the other with portions of it cut off and obscured by what comes in front of it but in this as in so much else an immense deal must be left to the instinct of the artist thirdly aim at simplicity in the elements or motives of your design do not crowd it with a score of different elements which produce a sense of confusion and irritation and in reality prove only a poverty of invention a real richness of invention as well as a richness of effect lies in using one or two perhaps at most three elements with variety in the treatment of them make yourself thoroughly master of the essential points in whatever elements you choose as the basis of your design before you set pencil to paper and you will find in almost any natural form you fix upon more than enough to give you all the variety and richness you require if you have sufficient natural fancy to play with it lastly return again and again and forevermore to nature the value of studying specimens of old embroidery is immense it makes you familiar with the principles and methods which experience has found to be true and useful it puts you into possession of the traditions of the art he that has no reverence for the traditions of his art seals his own doom he that is careless about them 
or treats them with superciliousness or will not give the time and pains necessary to understand them but thinks to start off afresh along clean new lines of his own stamps himself as an upstart makes himself perhaps if he is clever a nine days curiosity but loses himself by and by in extravagances and brings no fruit to perfection the study of old work then is of the highest importance is essential the patient and humble study of it but for what end to learn principles and methods to secure a sound foundation for oneself not to slavishly imitate results and live on bound hand and foot in the swaddling clothes of precedent learn your business in the schools but go out to nature for your inspirations see nature through your own eyes and be a persistent and curious observer of her infinite wonders yet to see nature in herself is not everything it is but half the matter the other half is to know how to use her for the purposes of fine art to know how to translate her into the language of art and this knowledge we acquire by a sound acquaintance with the essential conditions of whatever art we practice a frank acceptance of these conditions and a reverential appreciation of the teaching and examples of past workmen timidity and impudence are both alike fatal to an artist timidity which makes it impossible for him to see with his own eyes and find his own methods and impudence which makes him imagine that his own eyes and his own methods are the best that ever were end of section 35 recording by linda johnson end of arts and crafts essays by various authors